Hey guys, we're at OSMediaXReviews.com. We have a very retro review product for you today. This is actually the Hitachi G1000 series smartphone device. This thing actually came out way back in 2002. That's more than 10 years. Uh, so it's extremely, extremely, extremely old, um, but at the same time, it's intriguing to take a look at what smartphone technology was like more than uh, 10 years, 11 years ago. It actually ran on a very early build of Windows Mobile, so you actually had access to a full touchscreen experience, a QWERTY keyboard, and a camera experience, all the songs with Bluetooth and a mobile experience, but of course, you are lacking Wi-Fi connectivity, so you won't be able to access the web from a hotspot or anything like that. Again, the footprint of this thing is absolutely large. It reminds me of a fingerprint or actually a biometric, uh, uh, actually a barcode scanner. It's so large, it seems like something that people around Target or Walmart will walk around with, their, with something like this clipped onto their belts. It's just incredibly huge in today's standards. If I have something that's considered large in today's standards, such as a Kyocera Echo, you can see that how large this thing is. Um, granted, it has a large display and a full QWERTY keyboard, but still, it's no excuse for making something that's as large as a brick, in my opinion. Anyways, it's industrial, it's industrialized, and back in the day, I read a few reviews, some from Mobile Tech Reviews by Lisa Glade, and she said this thing was actually sophisticated uh, and quite appealing, and I do believe her, uh, because back in the day, I can see how this thing would be pretty interesting, uh, especially with, with its two-tone colors and design. You can see that the screen is quite large, it comes in actually at 3.5 inches, and uh, below the screen itself you have access to a full QWERTY keyboard in the style of a BlackBerry texting style. It's quite rigid, and to be honest, um, texting on it was easy, buttons are tactile and risen above the surface of the handset, but they are a little bit small, and also um, they are a little bit rigid sometimes, but they are... Um, spaced apart quite well, so as a thumb keyboard, it does a good job of providing you a fast way to text without having to peck out letters on an on-screen tiny keyboard. But uh, there you go, if you wanted that feature, you had it with this thing. Also, it had a speakerphone feature, which was heavily advertised on this model, because the speakerphone is just pretty much out here. So whenever you press that button, it directly takes you to the speakerphone mode. Uh, it's a super easy way to access the speakerphone feature with a large speaker going up on the top, and um, it was just easy to access. It's also a pocket PC, so of course you have all the functionalities of having a PDA while having the functionalities of a phone uh, two-in-one back in the day. You had talk and end keys as well. These were all backlit, which was kind of neat. TFT display was in full color, thankfully. On the top, you have an LED display for displaying when you're charging the handset, uh, when it's powered on, and we have notifications. There's some more notifications uh, LEDs on the top there. There's your earpiece speaker. And... A very interesting feature that actually I still appreciate in today's standards is it's actually swivel lens camera. It actually rotates uh, 360 degrees, which is quite nice. In the back, you can see how traditionally it's like today's camera. It sits in the back and you can take you know, pictures like so, pressing a button. But um, if I wanted to take self-portraits, I would just rotate this camera, and now it's facing myself, and I can take self-portraits. Now, this rotatable fish lens camera is something that I would like manufacturers to still implement in today's standards, but apparently that's something that no one's willing to do. Also interesting is that Hitachi hasn't been really making any smartphones lately either, so that's just something to note. Of course, it had a giant antenna because that was the norm back in those days, and you had a stylus on the very top of the handset. On the right-hand side, you also had access to a volume rocker that was quite easy to press and large. On the bottom of the device, you had access to a mini USB for syncing information, but you had to use this proprietary charger for charging it quite unconvenient. There's also a little bit of a cradle, which you can set it into in order to synchronize with your PC. If you want to use that instead of this, it also doubles as your audio jack. And on the left-hand side of the device, you had access to a battery release slot and also a hold switch. And um, there's also some settings you can adjust through this little slider. There's also a dedicated hotkey, which you can actually press to activate uh, a calendar or anything like that if you wanted to select an application. There's also a full drop dial on the side. You can also press it down to select things. So if I'm in a today's screen for a traditional Windows mobile screen, I could take a look at you know calendars and events and then scroll them up and down. Because again, Windows mobile isn't very touch friendly. Thus, why we have a style and we can select it up and down and then press it to access different features. So it's quite a forward-thinking implementation of a scroll wheel, scroll wheel there. And of course, since this thing was so large, it didn't have a mini or micro SD card slot. It had a full-sized SD card slot that could expand the memory up to 4 to 8 gigs. Um, quite convenient, actually. I do think that a full-size SD card is actually better than a mini or micro SD card because um, you can actually swap this out and then put it in your digital camera and then put it into your PC, which is actually seems to be a better idea in general. But of course, since sm smartphones these days are so small, 
they have to use a smaller standard still. There's a little bit of a headphone jack on the side here, but this is a 2.5mm headphone jack and not a full-size headphone, unfortunately. On the back, it isn't really attractive, but you have a, another large speaker. Um, it's got this nice concave design for acoustics, so actually this part comes in contact with the floor when you set it on a surface. So when you put it on here, you can actually hear things going out through the sides of the phone, and actually sound quality was quite impressive for this handset, even though it's actually a mono speaker and not a dual speaker. Additionally, the power on and off switch is actually on the back of the phone, like so, next to the IR port for beaming and sending information very slowly. Um, but that, that was a form of wireless that you know manufacturers has dropped nowadays. It's actually the same technology uh, found in remote controls, so you can actually use this as a remote control for your TV, a smart remote control, which is kind of nice. But anyways, the power on and off switch is quite similar to the Motorola Atrix of today's standards, where you had to press it like this in order to turn it on and off, um, which is, you know, Kind of easy to use one-handed, but I'm not a fan of that. I like it when power keys are on the top, and I've already talked about that with the Motorola Atrix. I'm going to say the same thing here. Actually, the screen is quite bright for yesteryear standards as well. There's a reset hole on the bottom, and then removing the back cover like so, you could access the giant battery for the G1000 series, which is actually quite large. It came in at 1,500 milliamps, quite small though. And of course, this was a CDMA device here in the United States with a, a two-year contract with Sprint or PBS, uh, and as a result, uh, it was actually priced at around $399, which is quite expensive as well. So back then, it was quite revolutionary. So it's quite interesting to take a look at how far we've really come with mobile technology and computing technology. And the thing was, this thing back then was considered revolutionary. You can definitely see so. It had a full touchscreen, had Windows Mobile, had a full QWERTY keyboard. It was one of the first smartphones to ever hit the market and really be considered functional. Um, but again, it was like a brick even back then. And um, yeah, just very interesting. It was very powerful too. It had a, uh, I believe, a 400 megahertz processor. I have to check back on that. It's probably even slower, um, but we'll say under 400 megahertz, maybe 200. Um, but back, again, back then, that was a huge step forwards in revolution and technology. So there are still tidbits that I still want manufacturers to do today, namely the fish lens camera, which is just so cool. Um, and I like the QWERTY keyboard as well. So thanks for watching this retro review of the Hitachi G1000 series pocket PC smartphone that went on Sprint service here in the United States. Thanks for watching.